Case in point, consider the act of retraction for this same double acting cylinder. The act of retraction necessitates the smaller tube-like volume of the rod end be filled while simultaneously the volume of the cap end is exhausted at low pressure. During the act of retraction, a solid steel rod is pulled into the rod end, which occupies space, thus displacing oil entering the rod end. Long story short, the tubular rod end volume necessitates less oil volume be filled than the fully cylindrical cap end. Again, consider a constant 2.2 gallons per minute of flow entering the rod end and answer this simple multiple choice question. No calculations required. The time to fully retract this cylinder will be blank as the time to fully extend the cylinder. A, less than, B, more than, C, the same as, D, none of the above, E, all of the above, and F, yes. If you said the time to retract will be A, less than the time to extend, you are correct. In fact, this answer is always correct, all the time, every time, in all scenarios, and never forget it. If you have a constant flow rate and less volume to fill, actuation time will always be less. At constant flow rates, double acting cylinders retract faster than they extend because they've got less volume to fill. Let's prove it. As we previously demonstrated, 2.2 gallons per minute is equivalent to 8.47 cubic inches per second. The volume of the tubular rod end at full retraction is roughly 264.2 cubic inches. Time is volume over flow rate. Substituting our calculated values for the volume of the rod end in units of cubic inches and flow rate in units of cubic inches per second demonstrates the cylinder should fully retract in roughly 31.2 seconds. What did I tell you? At a constant flow rate, reaction time is less than extension because there's less volume to fill. Using techniques as previously, one can also calculate retraction speed in either inches per second or feet per minute. Speed is length per time. The rod retracted 18 inches in 31.2 seconds, achieving a speed of roughly 0.577 inches per second. To convert this quantity to feet per minute necessitates a chain of conversion. First change inches per second to inches per minute, then inches per minute to feet per minute. To do so, one multiplies 0.577 inches per second times 60 seconds over one minute, such that the unit we don't want seconds cancels out, and the unit we do want minutes remain. This first stage of the unit conversion demonstrates that 0.532 inches per second is roughly equivalent to 34.6 inches per minute. Next, we need to convert inches per minute to feet per minute. To do so, one multiplies 34.6 inches per minute times one foot over 12 inches such the unit we don't want inches cancels out and the unit we do want feet remains. The final stage of the unit conversion demonstrates this cylinder extends at roughly 2.9 feet per minute. Like I said, at a constant flow rate, retraction always occurs faster than extension because there's less volume to fill. Before we move on to discuss pumps and rotating hydraulic actuators, let's see if you're tracking with this illustrated example problem. Consider a double acting hydraulic cylinder with the following dimensions. Diameter cap of six inches, diameter rod of 2.5 inches, a travel length of 24 inches. Let's say the cylinder is subjected to a constant flow rate of eight gallons per minute. See if you can solve for the time of extension in units of seconds and the speed of extension in units of inches per second and feet per minute. Extension necessitates liquid completely fill the fully cylindrical cap end. Additionally, see if you can solve for the time of retraction in units of seconds and the speed of retraction in units of inches per second and feet per minute. Retraction necessitates liquid completely fill the tubular rod end. By all means, pause the lecture and try this on your own. If you're tracking, you should have obtained the following results. The fully circular cap has an area of 28.3 square inches, and at full extension, the volume of the fully cylindrical cap end is 678.6 cubic inches. The ring-like annular rod end has an effective area of roughly 23.4 square inches, and the tubular rod end at full retraction has a volume of roughly 560.8 cubic inches. A chain unit conversion demonstrates eight gallons per minute is equivalent to 1,848 cubic inches per minute, which is equivalent to 30.8 cubic inches per second. Extension necessitates liquid completely fill the fully cylindrical cap end. Extension time is the volume of the cap end divided by flow rate. This yields an extension time of roughly 22 seconds. 
the rod moved 24 inches in 22 seconds, or around 1.1 inches per second. This corresponds to a speed of roughly 5.4 feet per minute. Retraction necessitates liquid completely fill the tubular rod end. Retraction time is the volume of the rod end divided by flow rate. This yields a retraction time of roughly 18.2 seconds. As one might expect, retraction occurs faster at the same flow rate because there's less volume to fill. Lastly, the rod retracted 24 inches in 18.2 seconds, or around 1.32 inches per second. This corresponds to a speed of roughly 6.6 feet per minute. All right, that wasn't too hard, was it? Let's now have a quick discussion about pumps and rotational hydraulic actuators like hydraulic motors before we bring this lecture to a close. As you are no doubt aware, a pump is a device that converts the rotating mechanical power of some prime mover, be it an electric motor or an internal combustion engine, to fluid power. Two aspects define fluid power, pressure and flow. We'll examine pressure, Pascal's law and pumps in greater detail in later lectures. This lecture restricts itself to flow. A common pump property is that of displacement, which is a measure of volume per revolution, meaning every time a pump shaft is turned one full revolution, it introduces that much volume into a hydraulic system. Consider a pump with a displacement of, let's say, 0.5 cubic inches per revolution, where one might encounter this displacement property on a pump data sheet written as CIR, as in C cubic inches I R revolution. To yield a usable flow rate, i.e. a volume per unit time, one needs to know at what rotational speed the pump is being driven at. The property of rotational speed is often expressed as N. Again, don't ask me why it's N. I don't know. It's measured in units of revolutions per minute or RPM. To yield a flow rate, one multiplies displacement per revolution times revolutions per minute. Q equals D times N. Units of revolutions cancel out and you'll be left with a unit of volume over time, i.e. a flow rate. Again, consider a pump with a displacement of 0.5 cubic inches per revolution being driven at a rotational speed of 1,780 revolutions per minute. What's the flow rate? Now, before you screw this up, listen carefully. What's the flow rate in gallons per minute? Multiply 0.5 cubic inches per revolution times 1,780 revolutions per minute. Revolutions cancel out, which yields a flow rate of 890 cubic inches per minute, which again might be expressed as CIM. This is not the answer we're looking for. We need to convert this to gallons per minute. To do so, one multiplies 890 cubic inches per minute times one gallon over 231 cubic inches, such the unit we don't want, cubic inches, cancels out, and you, we do want gallons remains. This yields a flow rate of roughly 3.9 gallons per minute. Again, flow rate calculations shouldn't be that hard. Any difficulty you have with this topic may be because of unit conversions. Stay neat, stay organized. You note two properties influence flow rate output of pumps, noticeably displacement per revolution and revolutions per minute. This implies pumps can vary their flow rate output by varying one or both of these properties. As we'll learn in later lectures, there exist fixed and variable displacement pumps. A simple, inexpensive, fixed displacement pump always outputs the same volume per revolution, and as the name implies, displacement is invariable. In contrast, a more sophisticated and coincidentally more expensive variable displacement pump has movable internal components that can increase or decrease displacement per revolution to meet flow requirements. Increased displacement per revolution means more flow rate at a given rotational speed. In contrast, decreased displacement per revolution means less flow rate at a given rotational speed. Another simple method can be used to vary flow rate even for fixed displacement pumps. All you got to do is just drive them faster or slower to meet flow requirements. Increased rotational speed means more flow rate at a given displacement. In contrast, decreased rotational speed means less flow rate at a given displacement. In much later lectures, we'll examine a power electronics device known as an inverter that can vary the output voltage magnitude and frequency to a motor under its direction, thus changing the motor prime mover and the pump's driven speed to vary flow rate. Lastly, do not labor under the mistaken impression that the property of displacement per revolution is a fixed and ever constant value, even for fixed displacement pumps. The displacement figure specified in a pump's data sheet is a single snapshot at a single operating condition known as the rated condition, i.e. what the pump has been designed to do. 
If the pump is being driven in excess or below its rated condition, one might expect displacement per revolution to vary. For example, let's say a hydraulic system is exerting a lot of force and necessitates super high pressures. Extremely high pressures, one might expect displacement per revolution to drop because of increased leakage. As if that wasn't enough, at super high pressures, the prime mover driving the pump may experience more load torque and the resultant rotational speed may also slow down. The combined effects of reduced displacement per revolution because of leakage and decreased rotational speed of the pump because of increased torque requirements, obviously being that flow rate understandably decreases and decreases at higher pressures. We'll examine pumps and motors in later lectures. Lastly, lastly, I should mention hydraulic actuators are not limited to linearly acting single and double acting hydraulic cylinders. There also exist rotational hydraulic actuators known as hydraulic motors, which I like to think of as anti-pumps. A pump is a device that converts rotational mechanical power into fluid power. In contrast, a hydraulic motor converts fluid power into rotational mechanical power. Even their schematic symbols are opposites. The schematic symbol of a pump shows an arrow pointing away from the pump into the hydraulic system. In contrast, the schematic symbol of a hydraulic motor shows arrows pointing into the motor from the hydraulic system. Two arrows indicate the motor is bidirectional, meaning it can rotate clockwise or anticlockwise depending on direction of fluid flow. Similar to pumps, hydraulic motors also have a displacement figure specified in volume per revolution. Only this figure means it necessitates that much volume be introduced by a pump for the motor to turn one full revolution. To calculate the resultant rotational speed output of a motor in units of RPM, one would divide flow rate by displacement per revolution, n equals q over d. Again, be careful of this arrangement. As simple as this formula seems, it is not without its traps. Displacement is often specified in CIR, which if you remember right, stands for cubic inches per revolution, whereas q, flow rate, is often specified in gallons per minute. There's a mismatch in volume units and you need to find some commonality. Although there exist other equally valid methods, my sincere advice is to convert Q in units of gallons per minute to cubic inches per minute before you attempt these calculations. For example, consider the previous pump with a displacement of 0.5 cubic inches per revolution being rotated at 1780 RPM. As we previously demonstrated, this results in a flow rate of roughly 3.9 gallons per minute. What if this pump output was being used to drive a bidirectional hydraulic motor with a large displacement of four cubic inches per revolution? What is the output rotational speed of the hydraulic motor shaft? As we previously demonstrated, 3.9 gallons per minute is equal to 890 cubic inches per minute. Rotational speed is flow rate divided by displacement. This yields a rotational speed of roughly 222.5 revolutions per minute. Pause to consider what's going on here. Some of you might be like, big deal. You got an electric motor turning a pump, which in turn, pardon the pun, turns a hydraulic motor. Why are you going to all this trouble when the electric motor itself is a rotational actuator? Why not just use the electric motor to directly drive the load? Check it out. Given the pump and hydraulic motor have different displacements per revolution, this system is essentially acting as a fluid-based step-down gearbox for the electric motor prime mover. We'll examine rotating mechanical power in greater detail in later lectures, but as a preview, mechanical power is a product of twisting force called torque, T, and rotational speed divided by a constant. It's obviously too much to ask of the real world, but consider a 100% efficient system where 100% of the high-speed, low-torque mechanical power output of the electric motor prime mover is converted into hydraulic power with a given pressure and flow rate by the pump and then the hydraulic motor converts 100% of the supplied hydraulic power to low speed, high torque rotating mechanical power. Can you dig it now? A small displacement pump being driven at a super fast speed yields a slower moving rotational actuator with significantly more torque. This forms the basis of a number of hydraulic devices, a common example being a hydraulically driven winch used to extract a mired vehicle with a low speed, high torque hydraulic motor. All right, before I cut you loose, try this quick illustrated example problem on for size. Consider a fixed displacement pump with a displacement of 0.6 CIR, or cubic inches per revolution, being driven at 1760 RPM. This pump is driving a hydraulic motor with a displacement of 0.832 CIR. 
So if you can determine the flow rate in units of gallons per minute and the rotational speed of the hydraulic motor in units of RPM. By all means, pause the lecture and try this on your own. If you're tracking, you should obtain the following results. Flow rate is the displacement of the pump times the rotational speed of the pump, which yields 1,056 cubic inches per minute, which is equivalent to 4.6 gallons per minute. Lastly, the rotational speed of the motor is flow rate in cubic inches per minute divided by the displacement of the motor. This yields 1,272.3 RPM. All right, that's all I got for you for this lecture. In conclusion, this lecture introduced the relation of flow rate, volume, and time for hydraulic systems. Additionally, we learned to calculate extension and retraction times and speeds for linear hydraulic cylinders. Lastly, we examined flow rate, displacement, and rotational speed calculations for pumps and rotating hydraulic actuators like hydraulic motors. Thank you very much for your attention and interest. We'll see you again during the next lecture of our series. Remember to tell your Lazy Lab partner about this resource. Be sure to check out the Big Bad Tech channel for additional resources and updates.